Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here on stage. Uh, as was introduced, my name is Anand Rao. Uh, I'm the global AI lead for PwC. PwC, as most of you would know, is one of the big four. Uh, does a lot of work in audit, consulting, products, and technology. My own background, I've been in AI for uh, 35 plus years. I uh, started off in the 80s doing my PhD in AI, so spent around a decade working aer aerospace and defense, essentially building AI technology. Then when AI winter set in, I switched gears and moved into management consulting, business consulting, and then AI, as all of us know, came, had a resurgence again in 2008-9, so I came with it, and I've been leading all of our efforts in AI. So what I wanted to talk today uh, is very much straddles this technology space and the business space. So everyone has heard about AI. Um, some of them are doing AI. Very few companies have actually deployed models and are really getting ROI on their AI initiatives. So uh, at least in US, if you look at the pro uh, proportions, roughly 30 to 40% of the companies are still exploring AI or just getting AI aware. And another 40 to 50 are dabbling in AI. When I say dabbling, they might have a p proof of concept here, another proof of concept in another division, just a disparate set of experiments that they are trying. Only around 20% of the companies are really using AI at their front end, at the front line people all using AI. Um, I'm talking about the broader industry, not just the tech companies. The proportions might be very different in a tech company. So I'm talking about financial services, manufacturing, healthcare, those kinds of companies is the proportion. So what I wanted to talk today was, how do you actually enhance ROI in AI? Um, so that's some of the challenges around it. And also, what do we really mean by ROI or return on investment when it comes to AI? So there are some very specific differences and changes to what business people are used to. I'll address three major challenges when it comes to ROI and AI. The first one, as you see there, is the measurement challenge. What exactly are we measuring? Next, we go into the deployment challenge. So what happens when you deploy an AI model and why should you be deploying a model? And lastly, the ethical and trust issue. I know we had some discussions earlier on in the same, same room around ethical AI by Deepak. So touch on some of those topics and essentially major on the leading practices that we are seeing, especially around those 20% of the companies they are doing well, how are they doing it? And we'll learn some lessons from there. Um, so the problem of ROI in AI. So lots of numbers here, but this is basically companies using AI. If you look at the chart on the left-hand side, I think it's a 2020-2021 data, uh, one of our uh, surveys, you'll see people using AI for increasing productivity, making better decisions, uh, better customer experience, lots of different things, both the leaders and the others. You'll see the yellow line, the leaders are obviously much uh, better at extracting some of those benefits than some of the others. So there's a lot of people using AI. Now, if you then ask them, are you getting the right ROI? Uh, invariably, there are lots of questions. Uh, is the AI really getting me the ROI? Uh, again, another survey which says of all the 70% of the people uh, companies surveyed, only one in 10 felt that they were achieving significant ROI. Right? So again, it, it, it's across all the different areas. Uh, other than maybe the media tech companies, others will say, oh, are we really getting the ROI? So that's the situation. So now why exactly are people asking this question? Isn't it obvious that AI is good, everyone is using AIs, therefore we should be using AI, right? So again, having lived through multiple AI winters, I can say that we need to address the ROI issue properly so that there's real value in businesses. Businesses just don't do this because everyone else is doing, and we are all living in this collective hallucination that it's all good for everyone because my competition is doing it. We really need to get the value. So that's the reason for addressing the challenges in uh, uh, ROI and AI. So the measurement challenge is very much around, what am I measuring? What do a return mean in AI? And what are the investments I'm making? We'll address both the soft and the hard elements, uh, how to quantify ROI in AI. So that's the measurement challenge. 
deployment challenges, how do I deploy AI to make it relevant and accessible throughout the enterprise and throughout all of my customer base, not just to the few data scientists who build the model or are comfortable using the model. How do I take it from there to the larger organization? And lastly, the ethical and trust challenge. Uh, how do I ensure that my AI is responsible and I don't fall into all of the ethical trust gaps? And the, lastly, how do I get my users to trust the AI? And again, we are displacing as AI, as we have talked, uh, it is helping people make better decisions in one sense or replacing the task that we do. Now, if we as people don't trust the machine, we're not going to hand it over to the, to the machine or the AI to make certain decisions. So how do we get uh, people to trust in the AI? That's a, that's a significant topic. Not much of attention has gone into that. ROI, uh, so measurement is challenging. Some figures over there. 79% of business leaders have promising proof of concepts, but fewer than 24% are actually seeing a positive return on their investments. Again, 39% of companies, uh, especially the ones who say that they are getting enough ROI, are actually doing a proper ROI analysis. Nearly 41% of them are just counting the AI projects, which obviously is no measure of how well am I doing, right? So there's very little of measurement currently going on. Number of reasons for that. So we'll just pick one or two uh, reasons and then dig deeper. But the fundamental difference here is what are you measuring against, right? So we'll come to that. So return on investment, AI is always measured against a human performance and say that it is at least 95%, 90%, 80% as accurate as a human. So, but which human are we measuring? So there are a number of issues around how do we look at the measures. So I'll go into a little bit of detail here. Now, what is ROI in AI? It should be no different to any other business ROI. It is return over investments, right? So that's the standard formula. Now, when we talk about return, return on what? A, a model is being deployed, so you're getting some benefits from the model. Obviously, the model costs something to build, so take the costs from the benefits, and that should be your return. But the challenge with AI, there's always this uncertainty. You'd have heard everyone saying, oh, my model is 80% accurate, my model is 90% accurate. Now, we go to the businesses and say, why are you selling me something which is only 90% accurate? What happens about the other 10%? Why should I give you money for, for giving me a, only a 90% accurate uh, a, a model? Right? So you need to account for that uh, inaccuracies, right? So uh, that's part of it, right? So what is the uncertainty in the benefit? And again, that is an average number. So in a specific decision, those numbers might vary. What is the investment? We talk about the resources to build the model. The cost of the resources is what people typically take, but there's some other hidden costs that we'll see. So we need to look at what are the predictions and how many predictions is my model doing and is it doing better than the human? Again, we'll come to better, which human and you need to measure that. And the challenge here is how many of us actually measure our own performance? All your C-level execs or any level exec, not necessarily C-level, we don't keep track of all the decisions and how good or bad we were in those decisions. We don't do that as humanity. If it is a if it works very well, that's my decision. So I was very intuitive and I knew what to do. If it's wrong, then, oh, it's not me. The market is bad, the competition reacted, the market is down, that's why it didn't really come out. So we really don't track our decisions. So now we are measuring AI with respect to ours, which is, again, non-existent, right? So there's some fundamental challenges here. Um, so how do we quantify um, this uh, uh, ROI? Again, I've just written a few of the, both on the returns and the investments, the hard and the soft. The hard is fairly straightforward, nothing, nothing new there. Uh, we can at least go about trying to look at the time savings, the cost savings, those are somewhat easier. Um, productivity increase gets challenging. People often say, I've saved 20% of five people's time, that doesn't mean that you suddenly get one FTE out, and that's where we get into, hey, does it really equal FTE? Because people are very good at filling up the space. If you get a 20% improvement through my algorithm, I'll find 
useful things to do for the other 20%. If you remove 80% of my time and I'm left with only 20%, then someone might notice, right? So again, we need to be careful as to how we measure these things and what we promise. But the uh, other side, the soft side, is the more tricky one, which we don't account for. So we don't account for, and look at the investment, the data, how much effort is required in actually labeling the data. Every organization, because we have tons and tons of data, but it's not the data that can be really used in machine learning. So you really need to have, be able to label the data, and that requires time. It requires effort, it requires expertise, it requires time. We generally don't account for that. Uh, compute and storage, uh, subject matter expertise, and so on, right? So I can go on, but those are some of the major things. And as I said, the baselining is the key question. Now we can say, okay, when you are labeling or when you're trying to assess the performance, let's take people and let's say there's an underwriting decision being done by underwriter today, and then let's take that as a baseline and measure it. Now, there's a great book here by Daniel Kahneman, a uh, well-known behavioral economist, and, and the other authors here. He talks about noise, noise in human judgment. Now, the same person, i.e. me, might take, for the same problem, might take different decisions at different times. It depends on my mood, right? So it depends on the decision, it depends on my mood. Uh, early morning when the, when the sun is out, I'm bright and cheerful, my decision could be quite different to late in the day when I've had 10 hours of meeting, I'll just say, I, I just need to finish it. Let's say you the, uh, take some decision. Now, this has been well documented in certain areas where we do have records of decisions, which is legal. Legal decision making has been recorded and people have essentially, uh, and all these three authors have analyzed that. So for the same person at different times, the way we take decision is different. The same problem given to all of us here, we might take different decisions. Why is that the case? Because each one of us has a different background. Different background, you might be an expert in legal, you might be an expert in manufacturing. So based on your past context, you might be taking a decision which is different. So now when we are comparing AI's performance with humans, which humans are we talking about? Are we taking just the, the single most expert in the organization? Are we taking a collection of experts? Are we taking everyone? Or are we taking this to be who were, didn't have any other job, so we gave them the data labeling, and they're the ones labeling it, and, and our performance is tied to their performance, right? So these are all tricky issues that we need to address in terms of how do we measure AI. So I want to move on from the, that challenge uh, to very much the deploying the model. Deploying models, once we go past the measurement, that's challenging because less than 50% of the models are deployed into production. We are in the early day st st stages of AI, and greater than 18% 18 of the models take uh, 90 days or more, right? So it takes 8.6 months on average to develop a prototype and put it into production. So substantial time and cost involved in deployment of models, and this is something that we are just learning. Uh, only over the past two, three years, we have deployed models at large scale where there are hundreds and thousands of people actually using the model, not just a few data scientists who build the model who are using the model. That's why the notion of ethics and so on become important because as Deepak was saying earlier, the notion of people who are building the AI and people who are using the AI are uh, different groups or there might be a slight overlap, but, but they're not uh, the same group. And that's where some of the challenges come. That leads us on to the third challenge, which is how do we uh, make sure that our AI is responsible, but also how do we make sure that we have a process for essentially bringing the users along, have the users trust in the AI system. Not only have the users trust in the AI system, but also have the AI decide which humans to trust. And that might look strange to you, so why should the AI judge us? Now, uh, there are massive open online courses where you'll see people is essentially judge each other as, as contestants and the AI is essentially mediating and then deciding which of those humans are right. So any of the extreme values are neglected and it's only the mean that it takes. So AI also needs to decide 
who is good at making the judgment. So you might be very good in a certain instance because you have that background. You might be good in some other instance. So the AI starts learning what are you good at and what are you good at. And based on that, it starts giving different weightage. So that's the level at which we are looking at. How do we trust AI? So again, uh, moving on here, so we will basically the, the numbers show that, right? So people want to build responsible AI, but very few people are acting on it, right? So we looked at a few of the things around ethical uh, AI, having the diversity of the people, having the right tools, right technologies, and so on. But there are still significant amounts of uh, challenge in making sure that not only are we building AI that is trustworthy, which is what the EU document talks about, just because you built the AI to be trustworthy along the principles of EU, doesn't mean that people will start trusting it. We have a number of examples because if my job is being replaced by the AI, and why should I trust the machine? Uh, especially when its performance is, let's say, 90% or 95% accurate. As a human, I'll always find an example from that 5% it doesn't do well and say, see, the AI is not performing well. But no one is testing the human as to whether the human is performing well in the other 95% of the time where the AI is performing. That test is not done by, by organizations, right? So you need to be careful on trying to determine what we mean by responsible and, and uh, how we are trusting. So the last uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, essentially uh, uh, look at uh, some of the leading practices uh, of AI. Uh, I look at five steps here. Uh, one slide for each of them, adopting a portfolio approach uh, to measuring AI. Second is looking at AI not in its isolation, but looking in terms of data analytics, automation, AI, uh, and the cloud. Looking at the processes that we use, the agile process for data science, as opposed to just the software, and the end-to-end -end and top-down governance, and another word here on culture, and specifically around a risk-based ethically aligned, data-driven, decision-aware culture, right? So uh, those are the five things that you need to do. So portfolio approaches. There's a fundamental difference between AI and software. AI is all about experimenting. So you have a number of models, you have got the data, you're building multiple models, and then choosing one. In some cases, you might have a good model and a good fit and you can deploy it. In some cases, you say, I can't get the accuracy. There is something else going on where the data is not capturing it, so I have to abandon the model. It's more like what you see on that picture. It's like uh, uh, drug design. When someone goes into, the pharma companies do the drug design, they basically have literally millions of uh, compounds, and by the time they go from the early inception stage all the way to phase one trial, it's roughly 10 years for them, $2.6 billion spent, and 12% success. So that's because it is a test and learn environment. Not suggesting that's what should be there for AI, but it is somewhat similar, right? So it doesn't take 10 years, but it does take a few months to try out different options and to pull out the one that makes sense. So you really should be looking at your portfolio of AI initiatives, and that way, some of them will be successful, some of them will fail. If you just pin all your hopes on one AI initiative, then you're really tied to that one. Uh, the other portfolio approach that you can draw inspiration uh, is uh, from financial uh, domain where there's a risk return trade-off. Similarly, when you have your portfolio of AI initiatives, you need to look at them and see what are some of the quote unquote easy use cases. Sentiment analysis, right? So lots of people have done it. Recommendation engine, lots of people have done it. You may not have done it, but you can be sure that you can somewhat get an answer. If it's something out of the blue, a moonshot, then you need to intersperse that with something that others have done so that you have a case uh, so you can look at the risk return. So have some good uh, use cases which are less risky where you know you can get the return versus some which are high risk so that you can keep your data scientists motivated. You get all these high-flying data scientists and then tell them, go build sentiment models for him and go do segmentation analysis, they're going to leave you, right? So you need both there. And then finally, how do you choose your project? Some which are option-creating initiatives, which are more innovative, and others which are more solid 
ROI generating initiative. So split your uh, portfolio in a way that you're having some hard ones, some easy ones, uh, and some which are risky, some which are less risky. So that's the message of this. The second one uh, is more around, we often say AI and start looking just at AI. We sometimes, organizations have a separate automation unit, separate data unit, separate analytics unit. It all needs to come together at the end of the day. There are some techniques which are different, it's sort of more advanced techniques, but you really should be looking at the convergence of data, analytics, AI, automation, all in the cloud, all of those coming together. It's not one or the other, and don't look at AI on its own. Some cases you may not want to do any AI, just a simple analytics, simple data collection might be what you need to do to collect the right amount of data before you go and build a model. So keep everything together as opposed to having one group for each. Uh, uh, software process, again, one of the, the key challenges that we see organizations do, especially if analytics and AI is within an IT department, they say, oh, just follow the agile process, follow the scrum process. So they essentially put data scientists within uh, a four-week sprint cycle, three-week sprint cycle, and what happens then is you need to produce something almost every day, every two days, and people just churn through uh, slicing and dicing of data. You don't get any insights, you just get better visualizations. And given the UI, UX, uh, uh, focus of some of these uh, models, it, you really don't get much out. So you, what you need to be doing is having a separate agile cycle where you're experimenting, testing and learning different models, but that goes from the original value scoping that you're doing with the business and the software. Once you get some of those models, you can then put it back into your product backlog or a sprint backlog, and then take that as part of your sprint cycle. Not saying that Agile is not needed for uh, AI and data science, but it's just that you need to interleave them. Once it's deployed, then you can have this value discovery along with the value delivery, and that's when you start seeing whether the model that I've essentially built in the lab is working in production. Again, there are a number of changes. It's not as simple as a software where if it's, not, if it's bug free, it'll work. Here, it might work, but the accuracy may be lower, sometimes higher, or the accuracy might improve over time. So which really leads us to the, the third one, where you really need to keep monitoring your models. The models will start deviating. Unlike software, the performance of models could deteriorate or could essentially get better. So you really need to keep tracking it. That's what we call as value stewardship. So all of those processes are involving multiple people. Again, this is something that came up earlier. You need a whole host of different people from data scientists to ethicists to, to business people all working through to get some of these processes. So again, fairly involved, but this is what I think companies need to do and not really put their data scientists or AI scientists within uh, agile scrums and say, go for it, and you're not going to get uh, very good results. Uh, very complex slide here, but this is a focus on governance. Uh, and a number of companies have fallen down because they have built AI models, but they didn't take into account the ethics and the governance properly. So there's one company which essentially collected the data from, from its app. Uh, they didn't get permission for children who were using the, the, the app to collect their data. And the court ruled that because they had not asked the permission of the children's parents who were the rightful guardians, uh, they cannot use the data. Not only could they not use the data, they had to drop the model that was built using the data, right? So that's what we are saying here in terms of the governance. Be very careful right from the start. So the, the London tube map kind of a picture that you are seeing there, the early part is all around strategy. How do you set your strategy? How do you decide? Uh, what are your third party systems doing? Your ecosystem, all of that you need to worry about as to how you are going to use them in your AI. And the middle portion there is the uh, chart around how do you build the model, how do you develop the model, how do you deploy the model, all of that is the middle part, right? So you need to have your bias check, your uh, uh, explainability check at every point in the way, and then understand where the model is going to be used so that you can then have the appropriate controls in place. So this is a, what we call as end-to-end -end governance, and it also is top-down governance, so from the senior exec all the way down to a data scientist, uh, they should know what to do and when to escalate different things. So again, number of these things we have written a lot. I'm just sort of synthesizing it all on one slide. I'll show you at the end uh, just one slide which goes through the, 
the overall uh, uh, architecture here. Uh, the culture, again, when we look at responsible AI, we look at the ethics part of it, the data and the AI ethics. It's an evolving area, and I know we had some discussions around ethics. It's not that we are going to solve all the problems, but whether we solve the problems or not, people are using AI, people are using the data, so we need some guardrails to get, get us going, otherwise there'll be nothing, and we end up in all kinds of problems. Of course, there are policies and regulations that are coming. Uh, policies are things that companies are working on. Regulations, obviously, the regulators will come. But then the middle part is what we call as the technical part, and that's where the data scientists are working to identify various issues with the way we develop these models. And again, for each one, there is a separate set of tools, techniques that people can use to uh, test for various attributes, including bias, interpretability, explainability, and so on that you see there. And the last one is around governance and risk management. And that's where the US focus, everyone is focusing on that. Let's do a risk-based approach uh, to, to looking at where AI is used. So if you look at this, this is very much what people call as a socio-technical system. The middle bar that you see is the technical part of it. On either the left and the right hand side, both sides are people. It's very much AI is not running on its own. It is helping people or it's aiding people in some way or taking, uh, doing people's jobs. So in that sense, it's a socio-technical system. And we need to be worried very much about the, how we as people control it. So that's a quick walkthrough of the five things. So adopt a portfolio approach. Uh, integrate your data analytics, AI, automation, all of them together. Change your processes so that you have an interleaved agile process for data science and for software. Look at end-to-end -end and top-down governance. And finally, look at a culture that is risk-based, data-driven, decision-aware culture. Um, so with that, uh, and now I'm doing for time, I uh, just wanted to close here with, um, with some reading. So, with the measurement challenge, there are a couple of articles that we have written on solving the ROI's problem and using the portfolio approach. Um, for the deployment challenge, there's a HBR article that we have written on operationalizing AI. And then finally, for uh, the responsible AI, there is a handbook uh, maturing from theory to practice, which gives you some of the steps around uh, what you do, very similar to what I had presented, but in more detail. So that's. Uh, that's a quick run through all the topics and uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions on any of these topics. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rao. Are there any questions from the floor before I start on the virtual questions? Okay, if there are any questions, please put your hand up. Okay, uh, one, of the, one thing I wanted to look at there, well, one of your slides, I noticed um, uh, a couple of words, it said cost of error or cost of errors. Now, people, well, as humans, we've come to accept human error as a fact of life, even if it's something terrible like an airliner crashing yeah. and it's pilot error, for instance. The same would not be the case with AI, I imagine. Yeah. So, so how can AI overcome that? Because the cost of a serious error with AI would be fatal, surely. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, it's a very good question. I think the onus on AI that we put is much more rigorous than humans, right? So everyone is aware of all the autonomous vehicles. It is, there have been a couple of incidents with autonomous vehicles, but even then, if you just look at the average number of miles driven by autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles, and the deaths there versus people driving, it is still far, far, far smaller, but still we would have more of a demand on the AI or the autonomous vehicles to be more accurate. Uh, yes, yeah, so the cost of the errors, there's one view that we should not have anything until it is foolproof. But there are many instances where you can't even measure that for a long, long time. So it's a matter of back to the risk-based notion, when is it acceptable to still use the AI so that we can collect some of that information and make the AI better? better than maybe some of the humans. So interestingly, in the book Noise, the authors take, one is uh, the judicial decision making where everything is documented. The other industry they actually take is insurance industry where you have the underwriting being done and then five years later, two years later, 10 years later, you can look at the performance of the actual loss. So the 
people are estimating the likely claims or the likely loss, and then after five years or 10 years, the loss actually happens. You can compare the two and see, did you get it right or did uh, the other person get it right? So you can use that kind of a measure now, not with people, but with the AI to make it better. As people, we generally don't learn. Uh, it's more the wisdom passed on from my senior to me, whereas here, uh, the AI will be able to learn from every one of our mistakes and hopefully get better. Okay, well, that's uh, reassuring to know. Um, another thing you said, you talked about uh, measurement, deployment, and um, ethical or trust. Uh, and, and obviously, they're, they're huge challenges. Which of those is the biggest challenge, in your opinion? <laughs> uh, I think all are very big challenges. It depends on the stage of evolution you are in. Um, if a company is, this is what you have seen, um, when they are in their early days of AI adoption, I think you are better off focusing on the measurement challenge. Um, you're not at come to the deployment, uh, better have a way solid uh, foundation on which you're building your AI. So early companies you're trying out AI, I would say focus there. As you move through that evolution, when you start deploying, start worrying about the deployment. When you start worrying about the deployment, the ethics actually comes in very close to it. When you're not deploying it to hundreds of people, it's only half a dozen, dozen data scientists. They are the ones who have built the model. They are the ones who are using the model. So the chances of them, quote unquote, misusing the model is much lower. You don't have to, I would say don't worry about it. It's just less of a concern. But once you start seeing that there is an ROI and you want to deploy it, and that's when you look at the second and the third challenge. Okay, it's a really uh, fascinating topic and a great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.